Welcome back to Wrong Sports, and this is episode three of four as I cover big events and scandals that are happening during the 1951 season. If you haven't checked out the previous episodes, you can check them out to the sides or in the playlist. I will also have a link above as well. Now, in those first two scandals, I went over two very big academic scandals that rocked two colleges for many years. With this next episode, I'll be covering something that isn't about academics or about cheating scandals. It's about violence. This isn't going to be fun either because there's going to be a lot of information that's from newspaper stories as well as statements from the players involved in the incident because this incident has a lot of racial undertones. It is an incident that changed the way football is played. It also changed the way we saw certain teams and it almost ruined a conference and almost ruined the career of a spectacular athlete. This is the story of the Johnny Bright incident. But before I get to the incident, I want you to quickly go down below and subscribe to the channel. Please also ring the bell so you can get updates on brand new videos and also check out my podcast, my Patreon, and my social media in the description below. And of course, like and share this video with other college football fans. But since this incident is titled the Johnny Bright Incident, we're going to start with Johnny Bright. He was born and raised in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He was born on June 11, 1930, and he was an athlete right from the get-go who was rarely on a losing team. Example being in high school, he won two state titles in football, went to two Final Fours in basketball, which is a huge accomplishment since basketball was and is still the biggest thing in Indiana. Plus, he was also a boxer, and he was on the track and field team where he won many titles there. After high school, he was first going to go to Michigan State in 1947, but left without even playing a sport. He would eventually end up at Drake University in Iowa as a track and field athlete with an option to try out in basketball and or football. And he would try out and quickly got on the football team, but had to redshirt in 1948, making his first season 1949. And Drake was very glad to have him, as in 1949, Bright would rush for 975 yards and throwing for another 975 yards to lead the nation in total offense, and Drake had a winning record at 6-2-1. In Bright's junior year of 1950, the halfback slash quarterback, he was one of the first ones to do this, rushed for 1,232 yards and he passed for 1,168 yards, setting an NCAA record for total offense offense that year. Bright's senior season was looking to be another amazing season as he was now a preseason Heisman candidate and lots of media attention were going to be around him. He would show off as Drake would be 5-0 and and Bright would lead the nation in both rushing and total offense as he had 821 yards rushing and 1300 plus total yards which is incredible for five games. Drake would be traveling for their sixth game as they would go to Stillwater, Oklahoma to play Oklahoma A&M, now known as Oklahoma State. Oklahoma A&M was 1-3 at the time, but everyone knew this was going to be a tough game for Drake because the last two times they played, Drake had not won as A&M shut them out in 1949 and they tied in 1950. So there's a quick setup for the game because I gotta get to the game because that's where the incident happened and there's also a lot of aftermath to talk about with the incident. And once this game started, it started pretty rough. As according to reports, Will Bang Smith had given Johnny Bright two shots within the first seven minutes of the game, knocking him loopy. But the third shot would be the most famous one as it was caught on camera by Des Moines Register cameraman Don Oltang and John Robinson. In the sequence, as you can clearly see here as the play is happening, Bright handed the ball off and moves back, like all quarterbacks do, to watch the play. The play is clearly several yards in front of Bright. In the next few sequences, though, you can see Wilbang Smith creeping closer and closer, and you can see him also moving his arm higher, getting ready for Johnny Bright's head. In the final sequence of the film, it clearly shows Smith making contact with Johnny Bright's jaw, and it occurred well after the play, and a couple of yards behind the play. This third shot would knock Bright out of the game for a moment, but he would eventually come back with his jaw broken to throw a 61-yard touchdown pass. 
After the touchdown pass, Bright tried to tough it out but was tackled again and would not return for the rest of the game. Drake did hold a one-point lead at half but couldn't score in the second half without Bright and they would lose 27-14. to And just another note that the referees did not call any penalties on Wilbank Smith after that forearm shot to Johnny Bright's jaw. The fourth hit that eventually took Johnny Bright out of the game was a gang tackle. There was a few late hits there but Referees didn't call anything on Bright during this game or previous games, and there'll be more about that coming up. Bright's jaw injury limited his effectiveness for the remainder of his senior season, but he did finish his college career with 5,983 yards in total offense, averaging better than 236 yards per game in total offense, and he scored 384 points in 25 games. Drake would go 19-6-2 over the three years he played at Drake, and as a senior, Bright earned 70% of the yards Drake gained and scored 70% of Drake's points, despite missing the better part of the final three games of that season. But after the game, the hit would be reported, but wouldn't become so big until the photos ran on the cover of Life magazine and New York Times picked up the story. They called it one of the ugliest racial incidents in college sports history. Due to the amazing photographs, the photographers won the Pulitzer Prize for this as well. And while the story was circulating all over the nation and people started to see the pics of the incident, Drake would demand that Oklahoma A&M apologize for the incident. But administrators in Stillwater kept silent on it. A&M coach J.B. Whitworth would say publicly that the hit was legal and he would not suspend Wilbanks. Wilbanks would end up playing the rest of the season, but it didn't help, as Oklahoma A&M would finish the season 3-7. and seven. But more aftermath about the hit would come out in the days after the game. First, after Drake got no apology from Oklahoma A&M, or really any acknowledgement of the hit, Drake would then go to the Missouri Valley Conference looking for some sort of punishment to give to Oklahoma A&M. But the Missouri Valley Conference would do nothing to punish them or punish Smith. So Drake would leave the Missouri Valley Conference just after the 1951 season. In protest, Bradley would join them as well, and it left the Missouri Valley Conference with five teams playing football for a handful of years. Nothing would be said about it by Oklahoma A&M and officials for the next few decades, even though pictures of this existed and Drake would yearly teach this to new athletes and bring it up constantly. Oklahoma A&M would also change their name to Oklahoma State and get into the Big 8 Conference in 1960. So again, nothing bad happened to this team due to this incident. After doing more research, I came across an article that covered the hitter, Will Bank Smith, later in his life. He stated he was told during the week and saw in their previous matchup that Johnny Bright may not be a great team player, since he would stay back after handing the ball off and not go down to continue to block or help out the play more. So that day when Wilbank saw Bright standing outside the play and watching his tailback sprint down the field with the ball, he interpreted it as poor sportsmanship. Will Banks would say in the interview in 2010 about Bright on that play, he stood back and put his hands on his hips, and I already kind of slowed down, but for some reason when he put his hands on his hips, I figured I would go over and reintroduce myself. That split-second decision would change the course of college football history. In that article, when asked if he thought the hit was legal, he said yes, but then after showing him the rule, he wasn't so sure, as the rule according to the 1951 NCAA rulebook, it's on page 35, rule 9, section 1, article 2, that's according to this article as well, I don't have the rule book. It states that no player shall meet an opponent with the knee, strike any part of an opponent's person with locked hands, forearm, elbow or upper arm, or strike an opponent's head, neck, or face, which something that Wilbanks did. Wilbanks would get a lot of hate mail as well as some fan mail due to the hit, but he would never answer any and got Oklahoma A&M to help him out with the mail issue. And when this game happened, race relations in Oklahoma and on campus were a little uneasy, as A&M just integrated in 1949, but traditional Southern values were still there. And it's not like things were going to immediately change in two years. 
But now, after looking further into the mindset of many in the area, and the week leading to this game, the A&M coaching staff took verbal shots at Bright during practice. On top of that, players and people heard Oklahoma A&M coaches and the head coach say about Bright, and I'm cleaning it up, we have to get his black butt out of here. In a 1999 TNT special that documented the story behind the Pulitzer Prize winning photographs, Drake tailback Gene McComber, who actually caught Bright's TD pass right after that hit, said he heard barbershop rumblings in town before kickoff that Bright wasn't expected to finish the game, so he also thought that something was going to happen. Smith and others may say that the hit and what happened wasn't racist as Bright did play Oklahoma A&M in Stillwater in 1949 and became the first black player to play there and had no incident like this. But it was also found that Johnny Bright wasn't allowed to be at the same hotel as the rest of his teammates so there was clear racial issues happening in the city at this point. But the reason that Smith had said he went after Bright in this game was because a Drake player had made a dirty hit on an Oklahoma A&M player the previous year. But the hit wasn't done by Bright, and Banks couldn't remember who did the hit the previous year, so really he had no reason for paying back Drake in this way. He wouldn't be too remorseful over the hit either, as he always thought it was a legal hit, since he had hit Bright twice before that. On top of that, he never talked or apologized to Bright in the years after the incident, and Bright would be drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles and would have been their first black player, but instead went to Canada to play there for the next decade and break tons of rushing records. Bright unfortunately would die at the rather young age of 53 after a heart attack during surgery. Bright was asked about the incident slightly before his death and said he was happy that college sports had changed after the hit, as there are a lot of teams that are integrated and safety standards were changed, and I'll get to that in a moment. But after being asked if he thinks about the hitter Smith, he says no, as there is no reason to waste his time on that, and said of the incident, there's no way it could not have been racially motivated. Smith would never play professionally and was mostly forgotten about, as he would die in 2020, with only a few stories and articles done about him and the incident. So remember I mentioned those safety standards? Well, after the incident, the NCAA didn't really do anything to punish a and but would change some equipment and some rule changes to make the game a little safer. One big equipment issue was that they added face masks to helmets. As you noticed in the pictures, Bright did not have a face mask, which would have protected him from the forearm to his jaw. Of course, the rule was there already to protect people from getting hit in the face, but the face mask actually did something to protect players from that. Along with that, the incident forced the NCAA to adopt new helmets and new blocking schemes and push more integration to happen in teams, and that would happen over the next decade or so. Along with the helmets and the new blocking schemes, there would also be a new rule. This would be introduced in the 1952 NCAA rulebook all because of this incident. As it says, in an effort to discourage rough play and make it more costly, ejection from the game has become mandatory in cases of flagrant personal fouls. This basically forced referees to actually start calling flagrant penalties like the one that Will Bank Smith did to Johnny Bright in this game. It would also give referees a little bit more power now as they could kick players out of the game for flagrant penalties like the one that Will Bank Smith did to Johnny Bright. And the rule change also gave players a little extra added layer of protection against dirty hits like this one. But I mentioned at the beginning of the video that Oklahoma State rarely if ever mentioned this incident for 50 years because they would eventually apologize to Drake, but it would take them 50 years. They didn't do it until 2005. Johnny Bright would never get an apology as he died in the mid-80s, but he would be honored at his alma mater with the naming of the field after him. And in 2020, Drake named a two-year college after him. And finally, Johnny Bright was also named Drake's greatest athlete, but unfortunately, he gets remembered more for this ugly incident than his amazing play during those three years. But even though Bright got the short end of the stick here, there are so many things that had to fall in line for this incident to even come to light. There had to be the supposed dirty play in the previous game, which apparently gave Smith the motivation for this hit. Plus, if Smith would have waited into the second quarter, no one may have even gotten to see this. The reason was because the photographers were apparently going to leave after the first quarter so they could get their photos to press on time. 
But thank you so much for checking out episode three of this four-part series as I go through all of the big events, all the big scandals, all the big incidents that happened during the 1951 season. In my final part, I'll be going over the ending of the University of San Francisco football team and why that is still being talked about to this day. But please make sure you like this video and share this video with other college football fans. As always, subscribe to the channel below and ring the bell. And you can check out the previous episodes from this series to the side, or it should be on your screen right now. Or check out some of the other videos in the playlist I've created. And have a fantastic day.